So next up we have uh, Chris Sturm from New Jersey Future. Uh, she's going to talk uh, about a few um, kind of case studies if you want. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Chris. Um, first I just have a question. I'm kind of curious who's in the audience. Um, how many of you are from CSO communities or CSO <laughs> utilities? Could you just raise your hand? Great, a lot. How many of you are regulators from the DEP or the EPA? How many are from nonprofit organizations? And how about consultants, private sector, private sector utilities? Okay. Anybody I missed? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, academics, I suppose. Um, all right. Well, I am pleased to be here. Um, I got to figure out how to use this. So you know about New Jersey Future. I'm here to talk about a few partnerships and really just so inspired by the tremendous story from Camden. That is a tough act to follow. Um, we want to hold up a couple others, but really thinking about how cities can work with their regional wastewater utility to solve CSO problems. Huge challenge and you just need all the partners you can get. And how do you fold in nonprofit organizations and how within city government, which I'm not going to talk about, but which Carrie touched on, Within city government, how is the sewer department going to work with the public communications, with the mayor's office, with the planners, with the parks department? These are some of the challenges that um, we're all going to be facing. So um, first, I just want to point out a great project in Newark. This is the Sussex Avenue Renew School that last year um, was uh, opened up in the fall, providing a bunch of new playgrounds to kids at the school, a track, gardens, and so on, um, brought together by a bunch of partners. And please raise your hand if you were involved in this project. I know Anthony Cucci's here from the Trust for Public Land. The City of Newark directed CDBG funding, Green Acres funding. Fifteen foundations, and the Dodge Foundation was one of them, helped to fund this, um, this park. The benefits are not only for the kids, which are really important, but also because this captures uh, one and a half quarter inch rainfall keeping that water out of the CSO system and mitigating flooding. Uh, the next example moves to the regional scale. How can we have green infrastructure spreading throughout the region? And here we really want to um, lift up the PVSC, and a bunch of you are here from PVSC. Please raise your hands. Um, PVSC has eight CSO communities, as well as a whole bunch of others that have a lot of stormwater management issues. And they created a program to promote green infrastructure and try to get demonstration projects in the ground. They partnered with the Rutgers Water Resource Program, raise your hands guys, who have landscape architects, engineers, community outreach experts, who provided training uh, throughout the region. They did feasibility studies for, in <coughs> municipalities showing what kinds of green infrastructure projects would actually work in which locations. And then where there's a strong municipal interest, they would do the engineering and landscape designs. And then PBSC stepped back in to help with cost share funding. And this program's ongoing, but one project which has been selected for funding is in the city of Patterson. It is um, community garden at Elysian Fields where cisterns um, are being installed to capture the rainwater from roofs to water the gardens. So a great project. Um, Partnerships are not limited to green infrastructure, of course, and as Andy talked earlier today, there are so many opportunities to save money through technical innovations in gray infrastructure. This example from Bergen County, the village of Ridgewood, um, focused on electricity and figuring out how to fuel an existing wastewater treatment plant completely with renewable sources. So they sort of um, updated a biogas um, process that converts waste, including food waste, to power, added solar panels, and the result is that the treatment plant is now fueled completely through renewable sources at no cost to the town through a 20-year public-private partnership. And I know there are partners here today from Middlesex Water Company, please raise your hand, and also from Natural System Utilities, which is sort of the technical brains behind the operation. Um, benefits, lower operating costs, and a lower environmental footprint, lower carbon mm -hmm. footprint. There are other kinds of public-private partnerships for gray infrastructure. I know that United Water has worked with the city of Bayonne to structure and manage and finance its water and sewer infrastructure, for example. So how do you get started if you want to do more of these? Um, I have to point out that New Jersey Future has a great resource page, and in your folder, hiding behind the great EPA resource list, is this document, which will take you to our website, njfuture.org backslash water. 
Um, I hope you will all go there. If you're not already on our Urban Water Networks list, I hope you'll sign up. Um, we also have news articles, information on events, and other resources. Um, you can read our Ripple Effects report, which really profiles this whole CSO situation in New Jersey. Also has a lot of great case studies and links to a much more detailed technical report for that important bedtime reading that Chris talked about. Um, you, most of you picked up the agenda for change outside. This was a sort of collaborative effort to figure out the, a strategy for moving forward on this tough issue of fixing our water infrastructure in our cities. Hot off the press as of yesterday, nothing like a deadline. We now have on our website a link to potential, um, to what well, not potential, to organizations that are working either statewide or in the 21 CSO cities on the issues of urban water infrastructure or environmental health or community redevelopment. Um, so there's a list for each city. They are incomplete. Um, I hope you will go and check it out and then um, push the button that says tell us who we're missing so we can kind of start to round out this list. Um, we also have two new reports up that are on the best practices for the long-term control plan. Um, we see this um, as a key milestone. A lot of the, you all are going to be putting your consulting teams together. So who are you going to hire and what are you going to ask them to do? Um, we, we hired some consultants to answer that question and one of them I know is here, um, John Rolak from Hatchmont McDonald. Carter Strickland will be here this afternoon. They've prepared a model RFP and a white paper um, with guidance from a committee that we created. And those are up on our website and I hope you'll take a look. Um, the other thing is that next week on Thursday at 9.30, PBSC is hosting a meeting for all of the CSO permittees who want to come, whether it's a municipality or a utility, to come hear from the consultants as they present their findings. Um, so if you're interested, Bridget, please raise your hand. Please let Bridget know. And if you can't reach Bridget, you, uh, you'll get my email address in a minute and I can help you connect. Um, at that same meeting will be a representative from the DEP talking about the funding programs that David Zimmer mentioned that are being reopened um, there to answer your questions. Um, so, almost done. I just want to see what I forgot here. Uh, stay tuned. Okay, so we talked earlier about stormwater fees in the city of Ithaca. New Jersey Future is looking into the legal issues around stormwater fees in New Jersey. We think there's a pretty clear path forward in CSO communities. Um, stay tuned. Um, we also want to be able to lift up other stories like the ones I just shared. So please let us know what's going on in your community. Also, we're interested in knowing what um, kinds of resources do you need? And I, I believe that we'll be collaborating with the DEP after the conference to um, survey all of you. But, um, you know, please, please keep us in mind because we're interested in doing what is most helpful. Um, finally, I just want to share contact information for myself, but more importantly for Jane Rosenblatt, who I don't think is in the room. She's sort of the invisible hand behind all the pretty emails you've been receiving over, over the last couple of weeks. And she is a, your great, best first point of contact at New Jersey Future for all things water related. So, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So our last speaker, Kim Gaddy, is actually two speakers. Uh, I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, so they're going to share their time and, and talk about the New Earth Day program. Okay, and while uh, they're looking for that presentation, I do want to acknowledge that uh, with this tag team, I have Pam Daniels here. Uh, we both are Newark residents, and we both work for nonprofits in the city of Newark. Pam works for United uh, Velsberg Service Organization, and I am the environmental justice organizer for Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund based in the city of Newark, and I also have an office in Mount Clair. And at this time, I do want to acknowledge some of the members who are here from the DIG, Doing Infrastructure Green. So if you all would just stand up, and you can see the wealth, stand up. Chris, Rosanna, let's go, come on, come on. Elizabeth, you can see the wealth of knowledge. We have individuals, the uh, DIG is a collaborative group of, of organizations and individuals 
who are working to ensure that green infrastructure will be a priority in the city of Newark. I also want to acknowledge my state director, Amy Goldsmith, who's in the room. Good up, ma'am. Um, and then I also, prior to DIG being formulated, the city of Newark established the first ever environmental commission in which I had the honor of serving the first uh, six years as the chair. And we worked very hard on a sustainability action plan where we focused a lot of our work over the two years uh, on green infrastructure issues, working with the community, working with individuals, working with the administration, the mayor, the council. So I do have to acknowledge two members of the City of North Environmental Commission. That's the commission, that's Elizabeth McGrady. Please stand up. And we have Brenda Toiler, one of the newest members. Brenda, right here down in the front. So, so there's a lot of great things happening, and it is because of individuals who live in these cities. We experience this firsthand. Individuals can visit our city. They can sometimes witness the floods. But as a resident, we see, live, and we feel the impacts of the major flooding that occurs in our community. So we understand the importance of green infrastructure. We understand about collaborating with individuals who can help us. But most importantly, as a resident, as an environmental advocate, it is so important that we are included and that we have a seat at the table. Because we can't leave the neighborhood. Some of us can, but we choose not to. And so it is extremely important that some of the information that Pam's going to talk about and how we need to engage community residents, and we are the voice of the voiceless because it is these individuals who are left out of the conversation. And the story is being formulated and told without us. And so we're so grateful that we're here today to let you know that there is a strong group of committed individuals in the city of Newark that's willing to roll up our sleeves and get to work because we understand the importance and we understand that there are so many people who are impacted by what is happening in our city of Newark. And so with our DIG organization, with the city of Newark's Environmental Commission, with our mayor and our, our municipal council, we are willing to get the job done. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daddy. Uh, you all have the a handout that has a what we figure was a step-by-step -step, um, um, process in getting our particular commission together. I won't take the time to go through those individually, but I wanted to uh, give you some perspective from a community-based organization that's not exactly versed in um, uh, green infrastructure long-term control plans, but um, we are in the business and on a mission to creating a stable and compassionate community in the Dalesburg neighborhood and the greater north. Um, and we do that through uh, housing and commercial development, human services, and um, neighborhood advocacy, of which, of course, green infrastructure certainly falls under. Um, so what happens when a community-based organization is invited to a green infrastructure planning table? Well, we have the opportunity to um, keep our neighborhood at the forefront of all the planning considerations. Um, more importantly, we get to ask questions and seek clarification and push back on those ideas or steps um, that may not go over well with our particular constituency. Um, and uh, another uh, point that was made earlier is that we get to translate these larger concepts into, e into easy to digest uh, pieces. Um, we do that through various uh, means. Um, we utilize social media, we're utilizing uh, surveys to collect information and keep folks informed. Um, and what we have heard throughout the day so far is that this recurring theme that this cannot be done in, the, in a vacuum um, because there's no one size fits all solution and, and in North alone, no two neighborhoods are alike. Uh, the Valesburg neighborhood has about 31,000 residents um, and is a peninsula surrounded by four other Essex County towns, East Orange, Irvington, South Orange, Maplewood, and of course Greater North. Um, we have several areas in the Valesburg neighborhood that do experience flooding um, during every snow, uh, snowstorm, every um, uh, rainstorm. Um, we also have a historic tributary that runs through the middle of Valesburg that uh, causes sh street flooding and residential flooding. Um, but once we came to this collaborative table and we uh, 
worked on an exercise, a, a mapping exercise, we realized uh, how how our challenges weren't even the worst challenges of the city. Um, you have um, the area of Sussex Avenue that we just pointed out, Meeker Avenue, Freeland Heights, and, and the Ironbound that are experiencing these um, these challenges way worse than Valesburg is. So although we did not make the first round of um, demonstration projects through the collaborative, we are able to um, recognize that some projects that we're currently working on um, to address the food desert issues are actually, in, in fact, helping to alleviate pressure on the system. Uh, UVSO manages two community garden properties. Um, the community garden space is part of our Heart of Valesburg organizing project. Um, and as part of our 2013 through 18 Valesburg neighborhood plan, we have goals to implement two community gardens in each of the eight Essex County tracks that run through our, our neighborhood. Um, so we, we, it's very important that you all that municipalities have the tools necessary in order to have these kinds of programs like the community garden spaces and uh, the adopt a lot program through the city of Newark is, has been a vehicle to do that where residents, um, not only organizations but residents can actually uh, release a, a garden space for $1 for an entire year and manage that property. So there's just so much value in that as well. Um, so the right partners at the table definitely ensures that no no neighborhood or um, vested stakeholder is left behind. And just to give you some practical advice, I'd um, uh, suggest that you try your best to avoid building the coalition through a transition, um, that, a municipal transition that is. Uh, perhaps it can't be avoided, but be sure to use uh, memos and um, other tools to offer complete transparency and bring uh, new administrative uh, personnel up to speed so you don't lose momentum. Um, above all else, we just want to make sure that we keep the human factor in mind. Um, keep asking the question, what does this step or this action mean to the everyday citizen? How will uh, what we're saying at this table uh, be taken by the, the residents as well? Um, and, and realize that the folks you have around the table will hopefully take a no-holds-bar approach because they are advocating on behalf of, of their constituency and um, the everyday resident is, is the reason why we're doing this in the first place. My mother always said that if you do things right the first time, you'll never have to do it again. And so green infrastructure is definitely an expense but opportunity that offers returns beyond uh, one, what one might see in any one administration. Um, and the long-term benefits to the greater community makes a statement that your administration um, makes logical investments for the, and, um, the first time around so that new leverage dollars are maximized and invested in areas for continued growth. Um, so good luck and thank you very much. So we have uh, everybody's been applauding the city of Camden, and I'd like to applaud them for giving us a little bit of extra time uh, since they ended a little bit early. So if there are any questions for uh, for the panelists, I'd like to take the opportunity to raise those now. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Wilbur McNeil. I'm from the Wickwake Park Association in Newark. Uh, we've been in the struggle for over 20 years. But one of the things, the problems that we run into, how do the citizens make money out of what's being proposed in these new projects. Now this room is full of people and most of them are on a paid salary. Nonprofits have a difficult time getting the expertise so they can show their citizens how they can earn a living at this boom in reconstructing their cities. Uh, anyone like to answer the question? Yeah, I think, thank you for that question. Uh, let's try to Thank you, uh, Mr. McNeil. <laughs> okay, I think I can talk loud. I think that's an excellent question, and that has been our issue. And I talked about and I've talked to you many times about that, and that's why we're concerned with ensuring that our residents are trained. Uh, we have worked with Rutgers Cooperative Extension to train residents on how to um, make their own rain barrels. We have to work with the city of New York One Stop to create the um, opportunities for training so that our residents can be prepared and trained, um, have the right kind of uh, knowledge to help 
when the uh, infrastructure needs begins to be addressed within our community. Because it's going to take some other means, but it's also going to take some other people um, to help. And so we have been working with the city of Newark uh, on a plan to begin to address what kind of small mom and pop businesses can also help with green infrastructure. So for example, if you look at Bourbon Street and you come down those businesses that are Bourbon Street, how can we engage those businesses to be a part of this green infrastructure movement? Their businesses are impacted as well. And so we are trying to bring the city, the businesses, the nonprofits, and everybody together to say that how can we help everyone collectively not only train each other to be prepared for this new movement, but also to work in a way that city residents won't be left out and nonprofits won't be left out. And so it is a work in progress, Wilbur, and you know, like me, that this is something that we've been working on in the city for some years, and we will continue uh, to have those conversations. If I can add uh, another answer to that question from the experience in Syracuse, on Value Count, I think it takes some uh, leadership uh, from the local government. On Value County was uh, kind of progressive in giving a small contract to what we call the Onondaga Earth Corps, a group of at-risk youth between 16 and 21 years old to go out and teach their peers about green infrastructure as part of the state grant program. <laughs> Doing that had uh, multiple benefits. Uh, just like in the 80s when I was taught as a third grader uh, the benefits of recycling, I'd go home and yell at my mom for throwing away the cans and not recycling them. So those youth then went home and told their parents about green infrastructure. Then those youth in the same program with that same seed money, and it was really seed money, it was about $25,000 for a year and a half, uh, began, began to design green infrastructure, go door to door, and sell it to the neighborhood. We want to put a, a green a rain garden on this corner. What do you think about it? Um, and then the county used their own capital money to build it. And vandalism does occur, but when you have those kinds of youth living in those kinds of communities, building those things, taking ownership over them, they take pride, they protect them. Uh, and they end up being vandalized less or not at all. Then that same group, because they've learned how to do public outreach, they've learned how to do design, installation, operations and maintenance of green infrastructure, then begin to get private contracts for all these private projects that the county's been doing. So that's one example of how these kids went from a uh, youth or training program, also co-funded by our Workforce Investment Board, uh, and now are becoming a private entity uh, making contracts with the green infrastructure. Maintenance, Chris. And if I could just add one thing, uh, also EPA's Brownfields program has, has a job. Um, EPA's Brownfields program has a job training grants um, in which uh, green infrastructure uh, uh, building and maintenance is eligible for those grant funds. So it is something that's available for me to look into um, for that. And it's an excellent way, as Chris was saying, to engage local uh, community groups in doing that. There's Earth Corps is involved in this as well. So it's something that has a lot of great assets to it. Uh, any other players? Uh, one, one thing that I heard about here was the real desire of
So for those of you who might not have heard the full question, essentially how you have effective, ongoing, maybe even iterative uh, communication, taking you feedback, showing that you're using it, or if you're not, why, uh, with your community members. Larry, do you approach that, um, that I suggested? I mean, that approach is uh, basically a committee of that the residents would be a part of
One is you heard from DEP that instead of just coming at this as a regulatory issue, they're coming at this as a partnership issue. That's a little bit different, um, and so we should all be taking advantage of that. It gives us an opportunity to work together and come up with solutions that don't just fit a regulatory box, but can be a little bit more innovative, that can be a little bit more creative. The second thing is, there's 21 cities in New Jersey that have this work for this issue. In other parts of the country, it's usually a metropolitan area, a big city. We have a situation where there's 21 cities that have an opportunity to learn from each other and work together. There's efficiencies in that, there's best practices that can be shared, uh, and again, there's, there's money that can be saved, and there's also a support network that can be created. So we should think about how we're able to collaborate better across cities. The third is that within each city, this is a problem and an issue that can't be dealt with a single department. And a lot of times we do. We have these silos within our city, and we say, well, it's that public works job, or that's the sewer department's job. <coughs> this is one that can't be solved with a single department. So we're going to have to be creative, and we should use it as an opportunity to be creative for how we get different departments working together to come up with these different sorts of solutions. And the fourth issue for us that, that is most exciting is that it's a chance to be really innovative. I'm not sure how well it's been communicated yet, but uh, we have a speaker later on today who will talk about this too, that most places around the country, this is a, strictly a regulatory issue. The EPA has come in and said, you must now do X and Y and Z. And so it puts these, those places on their heels. They then are reacting and have to meet the regulatory requirements. What EPA and DP are doing in New Jersey is very different. It's an opportunity to be proactive say this is where we want to go, let's go there together, let's figure out how to get there um, in the most innovative ways. And that means using some of the things that we've seen here today as being in this market. So we're really very excited about that. <coughs> You've seen some of the resources that we have in New Jersey Future in the document that you have in front of you. Um, we also have a large redevelopment forum coming up on the 13th. This will be one of the topics that we, we cover in that session. Um, we also do Smart Growth Awards. Um, we're just getting the, the uh, final nominations in right now for the best plans and projects from around the state. We're hoping to get at least one good green infrastructure or urban water plan uh, in this year, if not this year, then we've got to help for next year. Uh, so thank you all very much again. I would really appreciate you being here, and we appreciate what you the part of